here on Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Our guest today, author and scholar Norman Finkelstein, author of the new book, Gaza, An Inquest into Its Martyrdom. The book published as Israel's Facing a Possible International Criminal Court War Crimes Probe over its 2014 assault on Gaza, which killed more than 2,100 Palestinians, including over 500 children. I want to turn to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, talking about the 2014 military offensive in Gaza. He was speaking to Brian Williams of NBC News. You know, at a certain point, you say, what choice have you got? What would you do? What would you do if American cities, where are you sitting now, Brian, would be rocketed, would absorb hundreds of rockets? Uh, you know, you know what would you, you'd say? You'd say to your leader, a man's got to do what a man's got to do, and you'd say, a country's got to do what a country's got to do. We have to defend ourselves. We try to do it with the minimum uh, amount of uh, force or uh, with targeting uh, military uh, targets as best as we can, but we'll act to defend ourselves. No country can live like this. That was Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu justifying the 2014 military offensive in Gaza, that the International Criminal Court is apparently um, about to in uh, in open up a war crimes investigation into. Well, um, Benjamin Netanyahu says two things. Number one, Israel had no option. And number two, that it used the minimum amount of force. Well, let's look quickly at those two points. Point number one, everybody agreed that the reason they went, once the fighting began, Hamas had one goal. The goal was to end the siege of Gaza, to lift the siege. Under international law, that siege is illegal. It constitutes collective punishment which is illegal under international law. The siege has been condemned by everybody in the international community. He had an option. He didn't have to use force. He simply had to lift the siege. And then there wouldn't have been a conflict with Gaza. Number two, he claims he used minimum force. There's a lot to say about that. You can decide for yourself whether it's minimum force when Israel leveled 18,000 homes, how many Israeli homes were leveled? One. Israel killed 550 children. How many Israeli children were killed? One. Now, you might say, well, that's because Israel has a sophisticated civil defense system or Israel has Iron Dome. I won't go into that. I don't have time now. But there's a simple test. The test is, what did the Israeli combatants themselves see? What did they themselves say? We have the documentation, a report put out by the Israeli ex-service, uh, ex-combatant organization, Breaking the Silence. It's about 110 pages. You couldn't believe it. You know, I'll tell you, Amy, I still remember when I was reading it. I was in Turkey. I was going to a book festival. I was sitting in the back of a car and reading these descriptions of what the soldiers did. My skin was crawling. I was, like, shaking. Soldier after soldier after soldier. Now, bear in mind, you want to say they're partisan, the soldiers? Read the testimonies. They're not contrite. They're not remorseful. They're just describing what happened. There's no contrition. These aren't lefties, supporters of BDS. What do they describe? One after another after another says, our orders were shoot to kill anything that moves and anything that doesn't move. One after another after another says, Israel used insane amounts of firepower in Gaza. Israel used lunatic amounts of firepower in Gaza. These were the Israeli soldiers. The soldiers, they're describing it. One after another says, we blew up, destroyed systematically, methodically raised every house in sight. What does that mean, every house in sight? Seventy percent of the people in Gaza, they're refugees. It means they lost their homeland. The last thing they have, the only thing they have, the only thing they've ever had is their home. And the Israelis went in like a wrecking crew with their D-9 bulldozers. Explain how it began. How what? How the 2014 
the Israeli military invasion of you know, Gaza. These began. are hard things to explain because it depends on where you want to start. Where I start is at the end of April 2014, a national unity government was formed between Israel, between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. And the United States and the EU, surprisingly, they didn't break off negotiations with this new unity government, although it included a um, terrorist organization. And it enraged— Netanyahu. You're using air quotes. You're saying what the U.S. called a terrorist well, what Israel calls a terrorist organization, because at that time, the U.S. was willing to negotiate. Uh, and Netanyahu went into a rage, because he was being ignored over Iran. Now he's being ignored over Hamas. And so he finds a pretext. I don't want to go into the details now. He finds a pretext to try to provoke Hamas into reacting so that he can say, you see, they're a terrorist organization. And then it quickly uh, spiraled downwards, as it typically does. Uh, and then Israel went in. There was the uh, air assault. And then July 17th, the day the Malaysian airliner went down over the Ukraine, um, Netanyahu used that moment. The plane was down in the afternoon, and he allowed launches the ground invasion in the evening. Uh, you'd be surprised how, how finely attuned the Israelis are to the American news cycle. They begin Operation Protective Edge in 2008 with uh, Obama's election to the presidency on November 4th. They begin the ground invasion of, of Gaza during uh, well, 2004 was Operation Cast Lead. They begin Cast Lead in November 4th, 2008, when Obama's elected president. They begin Operation Protective Edge, then ground invasion on July 17th, when the airliner uh, is downed over the Ukraine. All the cameras are now riveted over there. And so they launch the attack. Uh, and the attack was, well, let me just quote to you Peter Moore, who was the head of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And I was even surprised by his remark. Peter Moore said, and I'm quoting him, paraphrasing him, but almost verbatim, he said, in my entire professional life, I have never seen destruction as I saw in Gaza. And that's coming from the, the head of the International Committee of the Red Cross, who is accustomed to seeing, witnessing war zones. Uh, what was done there was, uh, it was a crime against humanity. You take a place like Shujaya. Shujaya, it's a very densely populated neighborhood of 90,000 people. Israel dropped, believe it or not, it's hard to even fathom, more than 100 one-ton bombs on Shujaya. More than 100 one-ton bombs on Shujaya did the same thing to Rafa, did the same thing to Kuza, did the same thing to the whole Gaza Strip. And then you have this guy come along, and he said, we use discriminate force. We used proportionate force. I wanted to go to, after the an attack on a U.N. shelter in 2014, the Israeli military attacking in Gaza, which killed many Palestinian civilians, the spokesperson for UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency mm -hmm. for Palestine Refugees, broke down and cried during an interview in Al Jazeera. His name is Christopher Gunness. The rights of Palestinians, even their children, are wholesale denied, and it's appalling. <clears throat> Christopher Gunness is starting to cry. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> That's Christopher Gunness as the camera turns away from him, his head in his hands, later tweeting, there are times when tears speak more eloquently than words, mine pale into insignificance compared with Gaza's. Uh, Norman Finkelstein, to, we have to, two uh, minutes I left. I happen to know Chris Gunness. He's a really terrific guy. I hope he doesn't lose his job, because I said that. Uh, but he is a special guy. He's an unusual guy. He worked in Gaza. He's 
he's married to a man, he's married to a Jewish man, and he's married to an Israeli man. So you can imagine that Hamas was not, <laughs> was not thrilled with him. But he's very principled, and the tears were real. Anybody who lives there, has even passed through there, their heart breaks. That's what's, uh, what's been done to the people of Gaza. What do you think needs to be done now? Well, it's clear the first thing that has to be done is the siege has to be lifted. And the U.N. Human Rights Council, although its report was a total and complete whitewash and disgrace, uh, Mary McGowan Davis was the author of it, they did say, according to the law, the siege has to be list lifted immediately and unconditionally. That's the law. It has to be li lifted immediately and unconditionally. That's the first thing that has to be done. The siege has to end, the occupation has to end, and the people of Gaza, after 50 godforsaken years, should have the right to breathe and live a normal life. And how do you think that's going to happen? Um, it's a very tough moment right now, but there are always possibilities. In my opinion, there is the possibility in Gaza of a nonviolent uh, mass resistance trying to force open the um, checkpoints. And the West Bank, I don't have time to go through it now, I think a mass strategy of smacking Israeli soldiers, women and girls, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, footsteps of Ahed Tamimi, that kind of Who strategy— Who faces many years in prison right Yes. It, nobody's saying it's without risks. Ten seconds. But just as the children of Gaza when they threw stones at the Israelis in 1988 during the first intifada, shifted international public opinion. I think the people, the women of Gaza, if they have a Me Too campaign, I smacked an Israeli soldier today, I think that can win international public opinion also. You talked about a nonviolent campaign yeah, throughout I don't consider, the occupied uh, areas. Look, I'm in the tradition of Gandhi, and Gandhi was very clear. When you're facing huge odds against you, and you use kinds of force like scratching, slapping, Three kicking, seconds. Gandhi said, that's not violence. Norman Finkelstein, author of Gaza, An Inquest into Its Martyrdom. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.